Amen. I believe there is a people today, amen, that are following him, taking up their cross. And amen. It's good to be here. I mean, it's certainly a privilege to, to be with you and an honor to speak to, to the young people and, and hopefully with the help of the Lord, just say something, as, as Brother Branham said, to, to put courage in your heart. Amen, that's what we want to do, and I especially want to thank you, Brother Paul, for the invitation this week, not necessarily for preaching all these services, but uh, amen for, uh, for being here in the fellowship we've had together. Uh, I believe it's good for the ministry to, to be in unity together. Yeah, I believe that, amen, if there's ever a time that called for the unity of, of the ministry, it, it's this hour, amen, because... Amen. We're at the end time. I was telling the church the other day that, you know, um, we are literally at the end of, of, of the time. And we are speaking which could be the last services that will be spoken. And how important it is for us to, to listen, to receive, to react, and, and to do that. And because God does nothing in vain. I don't believe this service is in vain tonight. But uh, I believe he, he knows exactly who would be here. So God bless you. We, we certainly love you and appreciate you. And so good to see all the youth that have come, the ministry that have come to support it. May God bless you this evening. Amen. Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. <clears throat> our gracious Heavenly Father, I want to say that I love you, for Lord, and I thank you for this opportunity to stand before God's people Lord, and, and they are your people, Lord. And I pray that you would help me this evening to get myself out of the way, that you would anoint my lips, Lord, anoint the ears of the hearer. You know every heart. You know their needs. You know the power of the enemy and what he's trying to do in their lives. Lord, and you have a purpose for them, Father. They're your people. They're your children. They're somebody in the kingdom of God. And I pray, Lord, that you would just speak in a special way tonight. With your help, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. If you just turn in your Bible, <clears throat> perhaps to a familiar scripture to you, Judges, the eighth chapter, and I'll just speak to you for a moment on the scene that is happening here. <clears throat> How many love the word? Amen. Amen. Word is our strength. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> and let's go to the, I'm sorry, let's go to the 18th verse, and this is Gideon that is speaking. <clears throat> then he said unto Zeba and Zalmunna, What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. And he said, they, these, they were my brethren, even the sons of my mother, as the Lord liveth. If you had saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said unto Jether, his firstborn, Up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared, because he was yet a youth. Then Ziba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Ziba and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camels' necks, then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. You can be seated. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I am, uh, I was looking at this here a while back, and the scripture has always spoken to me where Gideon has asked his son to take his sword and, and, and slay the enemy. And when he wouldn't do it because he was afraid, 
these kings said, ask Gideon to kill them because they said, as a man is, so is his strength. That's what I'm going to speak to you this evening. I'm going to title it that, as a man is, so is his strength. What he has in him is his strength. I believe it's God's desire to put strength in us. That's the way he's always worked. His, his, the scripture says that I would you were in health and prosper even as your soul prospers. Even Ahab, a wicked king, when, when the prophet spoke to him and said that the Syrians are, are going to come back and go strengthen thyself, prepare yourself to meet the enemy. God has always provided a strength for his people. The word is our strength. Amen. When Abraham was, was getting old and he was waiting upon the promise to be fulfilled and he was, he, he, for 25 years he waited and he waited upon the Lord and God appeared to him and said, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now he told this to an old man and Brother Branham says that God was telling him, now draw your strength from me. And what was he doing? He said he was preparing him for the miracle that God was going to do in his life. God has the provided strength for every one of us. This age, amen, what we're going through, your personal struggles, your personal life, your family life, your, the family you came out of that, none of that. God has already measured that in to this age and what you're dealing with, and he's already provided what you need to overcome it. Praise the Lord. Brother Branham said in, in uh, Jehovah Jireh, he said, if I could ever get the Pentecostals to recognize their sons and daughters of God and heirs of Abraham, then no devil or thing can hold his people. Yeah. Nothing can hold them. Now, uh, um, and, and I quoted this this morning. I want to quote it again. He said that, he said, we need to be stable. We need to know where we're standing. He says, now you can honestly, sincerely be stable. You can be a stable Methodist. You can be a stable Baptist, Presbyterian, a Catholic, and be stable. But don't be stable in your church doctrine. Be stable in the Bible doctrine. Examine your doctrines by the Bible. Ask what Jesus was. If he isn't the same today, then your doctrine is wrong. How many believe that? Man, this, this scene that I'm reading, and I'm, um, I, I, uh, I, I just want to, if the help of the Lord, maybe incorporate a couple testimonies in there if I can, but... Um, uh, you know, we look at one another. I think we need to help one another. Help one another up. We live in the age of, of, of talking about one another and blasting out everybody's failures and, or what we disagree with one another on. And that's not what we should be about. We should be about helping one another up. Amen. And so this event that I'm reading to you is closing out the struggle between Israel and, and Midian as Zeba and Zalmunna are the kings of Midian. Previously already, the princes of Midian, Orb and Zeb, have already been terminated. And thus, the rulership of this nation that has tormented them for seven years is coming to a close. Gideon is standing here now with these rulers subdued in front of him. And he's standing there, and this is why he asked them the question, who were these men that you killed? And, and he said, they were men like you. They looked like a king. They carried themselves like kings. And he said, this was my family. This made Gideon a, a blood avenger. And, and he said, I wouldn't have killed you, but you've messed with my family. And so... I want you to keep in mind the spiritual aspect of it. Gideon turns to his firstborn son, Jether, which means abundance, and he told him, amen, rise up and draw your sword and slay these kings. I want you to notice that Gideon is asking his son to carry out my desire, for you are expressing my blood link. You're my firstborn son, 
And I want you to take part in the victory that has already been won. I want to say it again. I want you to take part in a victory that had already been won. Gideon wants his son to be what he is. Gideon is a mighty man of valor. Gideon didn't know this. It took God to tell him who he was. But here, this has always struck me, Brother Paul, because here stands a young man fully equipped to carry out his father's desire. Fully equipped, but what kept him from drawing the sword in that day of consummation was his own fear. And so instead of rising up and finishing what had, had the enemy had brought in upon him, amen, he stepped back and refused to take a part in what he was being asked to do. Listen, we're not having youth meetings like this just to have fun, though it is fun, and just to come together. It is because God is equipping you in this hour to carry out what this generation is called to fulfill. Amen. I once was a youth and sat in a chair like you, but now our years have, have gotten away from us. <laughs> right, Brother Samuel? Amen. We're getting older. We're not the last generation. There's a generation coming up behind us. Amen. And you are as fully equipped as a generation before you. And God has placed everything in your hands that you have need of. But what it takes is a strong hand of faith to take what God has provided because this sword, no matter how sharp it is, in the hand of faith, it takes a hand of faith to drive it to the heart of the enemy. If you're going to take anything tonight, it must be by faith. He's placed his son in a position to strike the last blow at these kings. You know, it could have been this king. It could have been Gideon. Amen. I'm going to take all the glory for myself, but I, I want my son to share in the victory. I want my son to know what it's like to stand victorious over rulers, principalities, and powers of darkness that once ruled over families and even generations of families, held them in fear and kept them back, kept them thinking they couldn't overcome. I want you to strike the last blow. Don't be afraid. These kings are already defeated. You're only carrying out what I have already done. Hallelujah. Ephesians 4, 8 says, therefore it is said when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. In other words, he led a train of vanquished foes. Amen. And he bestowed gifts on men. Amen. Christ already defeated the enemies that we are fighting. Amen. In this hour, every disease, amen, every afflicting, amen, lust and passion, all the perversion that we're dealing with this in the age. And some of these things become tangled knots amongst the people. And you don't know how can God do? How can he deliver? God has already vanquished them. He's already vanquished him. He's not asking you to do something he hasn't done. Nor is he asking you to do something you cannot do. Hallelujah. I remember one time, I hope this is all right, I was in Africa. And while I was there, and some of you might have heard this story before, but I think it goes well with this. Uh, a friend of mine who was a bush ranger over there, he would conduct classes for the rangers to go through certain stages. And the last stage of training for the rangers was called sleeping with the predators. Hallelujah. And I was privileged to go with him on the last class. I didn't get to get all the other steps. They just took me on the last class to sleep with the predators. And they literally 
puts you in a position where the predators come into your camp and, and you get to fellowship. <laughs> so what I remember about this brother Paul was this, this ranger, he was a brother. It, it was him and then it was me and a minister friend in another truck and then it was four other gentlemen in, in another truck. So there was three trucks. Before, before we went out on this, this camping trip, um, uh, we had a house service. Well, these four gentlemen were workers way up in the, um, in the oil fields, I think somewhere in North Africa, and then they came here, and, and they was in the house meeting, and then they were going to go with us on this, this camping trip. And, and I remember the day that we got up to do that. One of the brothers, he was a big, strapping South African gentleman. He was tall. He might have been 6'4", 6'5", big and strapping. I remember him talking to me. He said, you know, he goes, I've been in the bush many times. And he goes, when I'm out there, he said, I wear. And he, he, he told me what kind of knife he straps on. And he goes, he goes, they call me Rambo. Well, he said, Rambo. And, uh, and so... The day of, of, of sleeping with the predators comes, and out he comes, man, and he's, he is dressed to the nines, ready for the predators. I don't know what a big knife is going to do, but, but he has it on, and he's, he's totally equipped. And what the, the ranger said, he said, what I do, you must do also. He said, when I'm driving, you drive. If I stop, you stop. If I go, don't stop. You go. So we get out in the bush, and we're driving. And, and as we're driving, we're, we're going on through the bush, and we get in the middle of a bunch of elephants. Now, we're not in a zoo, okay, where you can walk away from the cage. There's a bunch of elephants, and they're starting to cross the path. Well, as they're coming, there's an opening there, and the, and the brother, he just guns it, and he goes right on through. The minister brother who's driving the truck I'm in, he just goes right on through. But these brothers that are carrying Rambo, Rambo's sitting in the back of the truck. He's not in the cab. He's in the back with another brother, and, and they, they don't punch it and go through. They just drive up real slow to the opening, and when they got up there, the elephants crossed over, and so they had to stop. So now... Rambo and his friends are surrounded by elephants. And if you've been around African elements, uh, elephants, they're big. And you could, hear, you could hear branches breaking. You could hear the trumpeting of the elephants. And I'll never forget the ranger. We pulled up around, around the bend, and the ranger got out of the car, and he slammed his hand down on the, on the top of the hood, and he goes, I told them to do what I said. Because they didn't listen. So then we drive to the camp. The brother had took out uh, half of a, a zebra and, and drug it around the camp to put the scent there. And, and we're at a water hole, and so we're going to watch these animals. And he put us all on shifts all night long that we would take shifts watching because even though you're going to sleep with the predators, you don't actually want to sleep with them, right? So we want a couple guys there to, if they get too close, you know, shine the light. And, and so... We're, you know, so we, we would take one an hour and a half shifts and, and two of us at a time. Well, Rambo had talked to me, and I can't, I'm calling him Rambo because I can't remember his name. So I just call him Rambo. But he said they called him Rambo, so I'll call him Rambo. And, and when he got out of that truck after that elephant experience, his demeanor, his way he carried himself had totally changed. He turned white. And he looked at me, and he goes, it was very skitty. <laughs> so he had an experience that scared him. So now we go into the camp, and we're there, and we're waiting, because lions and, and hyenas and all that, you could hear them out in the bush, and, and, and they're supposed to come and sniff the dead animal, and we, praise the Lord, get to look at them. And, and so... But the whole time, we taking shifts, all right, hour and a half, and then we sit there and watch. Hey, Amen. These, these brethren that sat in the back of the truck, and they were very scared, they never went to sleep at all. They just kept shining their light like this the whole night long. They never slept. Rambo had totally changed, and what happened? Fear ruined the experience of the camp. One man's fear. 
They even told me, I had laid on the ground and was sleeping, and they told me, they said, you know a red Roman just crawled right to you, and, and, uh, and, and I'm like, well, thank you. Well, red Roman looks like a tarantula. It's, it's big, and, and, and you can see the tracks right where I had slept. It was right, came up right up here, and then it just continued on right on this other side. This thing crawled right over the top of me, and they said, we watched it. You know, I'm tired of just being informing what's going on around us. Man, if you're equipped and you're Rambo, at least save me from a spider. Well, I'm saying that to say this. You can look the part. You can have the equipment. You can sing with the angels. But if you don't put into operation what he tells you to do, amen, you are not going to be able to stand the experience. And here, here is Jether. Now, if you've read his story, you'll find out this is his defining moment. This is where we hear of him, and this is where he comes into existence, and this is where he goes out of existence. Amen, because you find out because he was afraid, amen, uh, uh, Gideon had 70 sons. One of them was, was from a concubine, and that man's name was Abimelech, and that man rose up and wanted to be the ruler, and he killed all of the sons except the youngest, which means the firstborn died with all the rest in that scourge. But I often wondered, what if that boy had got the courage at that moment to draw the sword and destroy those kings that laid in front of him, amen, his, the next chapter of his life would have been different. And God brings moments like this into our life to confront something. Amen, that you might be afraid of. And even in their stature and in their rulership is greater than you. Amen, but God said, I'm asking you to draw the sword and strike the final blow. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Takes a strong hand of faith. This was his firstborn son. You're the church of the firstborn. And God doesn't ask you to do something you cannot do. For what he asked you is not tied to your ability. But it's tied to his word. That's why any experience we have must go back to his word. Amen. Amen. Our birth, amen, must come from the word. I remember when the Lord called me at the age of 17 to preach. I was in prayer. You know, it's a good place to have communion with the Lord is while you're praying. And I was in prayer, and it was, uh, it was close to midnight. It was somewhere. It was really late in the night, and, and I was praying. And the Lord just spoke to my heart and says, you're going to preach the word. And, I, and I, I remember just in my heart, just speaking back, says, no, no, I'm not. And he never said any. He only said, all he said right after that, he said, Acts 5, and he named the verse, and he said, Acts 5 in the verse, and I didn't know what it was, but I was having an experience but I didn't know what it was. But I hear in his voice telling me, you're going to preach, and he gave me the word. Well, then I went and looked at the word because you can hear a voice. You can have an experience, but if it doesn't line up with the word, God doesn't ask you to hang on to something that's not of him. And so when I went back and looked at Acts 5.19, it says, the angel of the Lord came to them by night and told them to go stand in the temple and teach the words of this life. So what the voice told me was confirmed by the word. It wasn't my imagination. I didn't dredge it up and ask it to happen. I didn't even know what that scripture said. And I want to tell you, any experience you've ever had, go back and find it in the word. Because once it's in the word... Once it's for you find it in the word, Satan cannot take it from you. Any experience you've ever had, amen, he can take from you because that's his nature. But when it comes back to the word, hallelujah. I want to, I just want to take this thought from this statement of the king as a man is, so is his strength. You're as strong as what you have inside of you. Strength is measured in different ways. 
naturally and spiritually. If we try to live this in our own strength, you'll find your strength is tied to your ability, which God cannot use. Amen. Brother Branham said, Moses offered God his own ability, and God couldn't use one thing that Moses offered of his human ability. The Bible said in the book of Acts that Moses was a man mighty in word and deed, learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he cannot use it. And he can't use yours. Paul said, I had to forget everything I ever know to learn Christ. This was a man that was steeped in the scripture concerning zeal, a Pharisee, a Jew of the Jews, a teacher of the Old Testament. And he had to forget everything he knew. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's right. Hallelujah. Your ability gets in the way of the will and power of God. But faith is tied to God. God's not even wanting to use your faith. Brother Ram says your faith is no good. We need his faith. When the man at the gate beautiful was healed, it wasn't by Peter's faith. It was in the name of Jesus Christ and by the faith of Jesus Christ that that man rose up and walked. So that means Jesus Christ is here to work outside of your ability and put in you his own power. Praise the Lord. And this is what the story of Gideon highlights to us is in prophecy it's highlighting the work of Jesus Christ. The strength of God flowed through the weakness, not the ability of Gideon. Because Gideon, really, we'll find out, was afraid. And if anybody could teach somebody else about fear, it was Gideon. And now that same trait is coming to his son of fear. You see, it carries on. Just like Abraham under pressure would tell a lie, so would Isaac. Come on, natural traits coming from your own abilities, figured out by your own reasoning, extrapolating what's going to happen to you in the future. As we've been preaching, amen, when, when Satan comes into your reason and he tells you something, Jesus said he's telling a lie. And when he's speaking a lie, he's talking about himself. The fears he's trying to put on you is his own fears. It's his own hopelessness. He's lost his first estate. You've got yours back. He cannot be redeemed. You can be redeemed. He cannot receive the Holy Ghost. You can receive the Holy Ghost. He cannot be restored. You can be restored. You're fully equipped. I wonder how many of our young people are standing here tonight equipped with the sword in the final battle. A battle that's already won. You think Satan can stop this rapture? He can't stop it. Amen. He's trying everything he can do to produce his own body change through all this perversion that's going on in this hour. Amen. Trying to t teach the young people that they don't need the permission of their parents. If they want to transition into another sex and whatever more, he's trying to produce his own body change. I don't need his permission. I don't need his permission to leave his camp. I don't need his permission, amen, to leave what he's tried to place upon me. For greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Gee, I found out myself, my own self, that God don't need my ability. Amen. He needs me to be patient with his. I learned patience. You know, I know that's a dangerous statement to make, Brother Paul. You say, I learned patience, and you're like, oh, it means you're totally patient. I never said that. I said, I learned patience. <laughs> Amen. God will teach it to you, because patience, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So, Gideon himself knew what it was like to be fearful. He was a coward. And then when God met him, and see, this is the principle of the message. You can find this in the book of Judges. This is the principle of the message. This is the only time in the book of Judges you'll find a prophet coming to the people. 
And, and here, the principle of the message, a prophet comes and points him to a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his mighty power, and how he brought them out of Egypt, and how he delivered them with his mighty hand. He said, but you have not obeyed his voice. Now, this is the amazing thing, is that they have been living under this torment for seven years. God delivered them into that, and they were sons of God living in the promised land. And they went under captivity willingly. Sons of God, captive in the place God has put them. What a shame that with all the resources that God had promised to watch over that land and that land will always provide for you if you stay with my word but if you begin to bring the idols in that the other nations have amen you're going to lose that what happened they begin to worship other gods you know it's important to know who the Midianites are they are the descendants of Midian, who is the son of Abraham from his second wife, Keturah. The Bible says that when his son, those sons got older from that second wife, that he sent them away from Isaac and sent them to the east. He wanted a separation between, amen, the promised seed and the, the children of the second wife. And he sent them away with gifts. So they didn't leave with nothing. They went away with gifts. And, and, and they lived in the east. I think it's a very important note to, to bring into focus here that these are descendants of those who had relationship with Abraham. But not according to the promise. You'll find this nature in every false doctrine, every false movement. Anything associated with the truth that's not of God, they all have this in common. They lack that promised birth. Midian begins to pop up here and there in the scripture after he sent them away to the east. You can find them there. They're the ones who, who was also in the selling of Joseph. Uh, they took them and, and the Ishmaelites came and, and, then, and, there, and then they helped in the selling of Joseph. And then you'll find out they're also close relation, of course, to Ishmael. And they both have it in common. They both were sent away. Man, their relations with a grudge. But you'll find the Midianites most prominently in the time of Moses because it's something that when God sends a prophet, there's people that rise to prominence in that time because of that influence of that prophet. My, if it hadn't been for that prophet, you might not ever hear of them. But there's a benefit of God sending a prophet. And, and you find that when, when Moses fl uh, fled from Pharaoh and he went down to Midian, he marries the daughter of, of the, pre the priest of Midian, Jethro, and he lives there until he receives his commission to go back and deliver Israel from Egypt. And so in that time, Israel and Midian have a friendly relationship. Actually, it's very strong ties that they have together. Numbers 10 tells us a Midianite acted as a guide for Israel in their wanderings in the wilderness. Moses invited him to stay with them and go into the promised land with them. But something happened between Israel and Midian to rupture their relationship. That was found in Numbers 22. And there, Balaam become involved. You find this is a spirit that becomes prevalent. It's prevalent at this hour and it's prevalent in the church ages. Is the spirit of Balaam. Balaam become involved in this relationship and he, he suggested that one of the princes of Midian would use his daughter and connected her with a leader in Israel. You see, because Satan attacks the leaders. And so much did it rupture 
that relationship that it was the Midianite women which seduced the Israelite men and it resulted in a slaughter in which also Balaam was killed. In fact, the Lord said, vex the Midianites for they smite and smite them for they vex you with their wiles. That's the last battle that Moses oversaw before he was taken home was to deal with these Midianites. The Midianites out of whom he took a wife, out of whom he had a relationship with. And now he is commanded, you vex them because they have vexed you. Amen. So this is a major separation between these two nations who are stepbrothers in relation. You know, Satan is a master at destroying relationships. That spirit of Balaam is still alive. And he knows how to connect leaders to bring trouble, cause problems in the camp of the Lord. We all know the story of Balaam. Balaam was a hireling prophet. He could go either way. He could speak the words of God or he could speak the words of man. And he was hired by Balak, the Moabites, Lot's children because they didn't want to have anything to do with Israel coming through their land. But they knew Israel was a successful people, that God was with them, that the power of God was manifest amongst them in signs and wonders and healings and deliverances. And there was a prophet there who was carrying the word of God and the shout of the king is in the camp. And so they hired a, a prophet to come speak something against these people. Curse them. Find something bad about Moses. Find something bad about the young people. Find something bad about Israel. Because God is going to have to curse them. Moses, uh, uh, excuse me, Balaam tried to do it. Amen. He, we, he, told, he told Balak, he said, I'm going to go ask the Lord for permission. And, and if he tells me I can, I will. If he tells me I can't, I can't do it. So he went and asked the Lord, and the Lord says, no, you can't do it. These are my people. So he goes back to Balak and said, I can't do it. Balak said, I'll give you more money. I'll give you more money to leave the word. I'll give you success. He made an offering to a man that was truly gifted, truly equipped. He was in a position he could really help the people. But his appetite, his ability. So he went back and he said, well, I'm going to go back and ask the Lord again. And the Lord came and he said, you go and speak, but you're only going to say what I put in your mouth. And so he goes and as he goes, we know the story. He's met by an angel of the Lord and he doesn't see him, but his animal sees him. Right, and the animal won't go. And then we see Balaam caught into a fit of road rage and he tries to beat his animal up. You imagine how, how horrible it looked, him having, having a temper fit and he's beating his animal and the animal turns and speaks to him, haven't I been good to you? <laughs> you see somebody talking to themselves. This could be what's going on. But that animal saw the angel of the Lord. And when, because of that action, it opened the eyes of this prophet and he saw the angel of the Lord. So when he went up and Balak said, listen, let's go over here and I can show you some things about these folks in the message and we can find a place God's going to have to curse them. No matter what he saw wrong with them, God would not allow them to be cursed. Let me tell you, that's the same God today. No matter what flaws, no matter what failures you might find amongst the people, amen, this is God's promise. When you reach out and try to do something about it, you are touching God's anointed. Could God's anointed have failures? Can they have backslidings? Oh, yes, they can. You're still in your human body. Amen, but the shout of the king is in the camp. The word of a prophet is amongst us. God is with us. This, this influence, he, he said, I can only, and some of the most beautiful prophecies in scripture flowed out of Balaam and the king, of, king Balak said, listen, don't say anything at all. You're not doing any good for me here. 
So he went back, but Balaam didn't forget. And he realized, you know what? I can get God to deal with them in death. I want to tell you, God hated it then and he hates it now. He hates immorality. Amen. It's not a church flying a rainbow flag and, and flying an all-inclusion and everything. God hates immorality. He doesn't hate you. He hates immorality. So he will change your life. He'll clean you up. You're not out without resource. And there was the rift. There was this, this deep hatred and enmity now between these started when a false prophet, a hireling prophet, ruptured that relationship. <clears throat> Midian is the main figure in Israel against Israel at this time. So as we said, Midian was a friend and a relative, but we're not born of the same promise. You know, we have a lot of folks leaving the message. They'll be friends for a while, but they'll become enemies when Balaamism comes among them because the spirit of Balaamism is looking for someone to teach. Mm. But the Bible tells us in chapter six that they join confederacy. This is what spirits do. They join confederacy with Amalek, who is the children of Esau. Who's Esau? He's a man who did not value the birthright. But he found it easy to sell it out for a moment of appetite. There's already been a prophecy over these boys. The elder shall serve the younger. The prophecy is holy. It's from God. Jacob was in line for that birthright. But the mother got involved. I trust this is all right. The mother got involved. And she, somewhere along the line, because the parents were rift and they separated in their affections over their children, they both, amen, amen, they tried to manufacture what God said. When God had already said, Jacob's going to get the birthright. When the time for birthright, the promise, uh, the blessing was to be given, amen, the church Rebecca knew about it and she called Jacob in and said, listen, your father has called Esau and says, come and say, let's pray. He's going he's to give the blessing. He said, and, and she said, he's going to go out and he's going to kill and bring venison, the venison stew that your father likes. I know how to make that. And here, I got your brother's clothes. I'm going to put them upon you and I'm going to make that stew and you're going to take it in and you're going to get the blessing that your brother is supposed to get. You see, the problem of it is, Jacob is trying to get that blessing wearing someone else's coat. You all right? Good. Can I have your coat? It ain't going to fit me. I don't mean that wrong. We're just... You know, sometimes young people, we feel like we got to wear someone else's coat to get the blessing. You know, God did not call me to, to be uh, uh, Brother Paul. Hmm? I feel the pull, I hear the call, and I know his spirit. Brother Samuel, he never asked me to be him. But somehow we feel like we got to have, we got to all have the same experience. Because a church tells us how to do it. And the church knows how to make a good stew. And wear the same, if I wear the clothes of Brother Paul, I'm going to get the blessing of the Father. I smell like him. 
Praise God, I got it. No, you don't get it. It's going to cause you a lot of trouble trying to act like somebody else. You think because you shout like somebody, jump like somebody, run like somebody, you got it. God never asked you to imitate anybody else. He asked you to have your own experience. Get your own. He never asked me to act like Brother Paul or Brother Samuel or anybody else. God is not here to give a church birth. He predestinates it. He predestinates your moment of the Holy Ghost. It can't be taught into you. Come on, a mother can put a coat on you and bake up a stew. And I don't think you bake stew. Cook up a stew, amen. It's not gonna give you the Holy Ghost. You gotta get it by meeting him personally face to face where God talks to you and you talk back to him. If you're a son of God, that's how he meets you. It's a nice coat. Thank you, brother. One day I'm going to grow into it. I remember, Brother Paul, I, I did this. I was a number of years ago. I'm not telling you these things to tell you where I've been. I'm telling you things to help you. God can use these simple things like this and you don't even know what he's doing. Uh, and it was 2019 and I was way in the north in India. We was in a convention and there was, there was a bunch of ministers sitting over, over on this side and there's a man caught my attention. He was big and tall, sat right on the front. He had this nice shiny suit on, nice silver shiny suit. He's just looking at me. And I, I can't speak uh, their language and, and so I'm preaching and Brother Roshan is interpreting, and I'm talking about Jacob getting the blessing, trying to get it, and, and I they kept getting attracted to that man, didn't know why, so I went over there, and I said, man, give me your coat. And he looked at me like I, I had asked him to give me everything he ever owned. He looked real scared. He, and he took his coat off, and he, gave, he just stared. He never made a smile. He never did anything. He just gave it to me. And then I went over to him. And I, I knelt down before him. Sorry, Brother Paul. We're just going to have to do this. They need to get awake and so do you. Amen. <laughs> bless me, Father. Bless me. <laughs> I don't think Isaac was laughing. Okay. I won't. Oh, yes. And, and I said, and here's a blind prophet being deceived. I said, God don't want you with another man's coat. And that man stared at me. And there was a young man in the back. He's one of the ministers. He began to rejoice and shout. I didn't know, have a clue what was going on. I took the coat off. Here, help me. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, you take that to the cleaners. Amen. I took the coat off and a man put it on. He got up and left. Thanks for the coat. Don't leave. <laughs> He got up and left. I had no idea what was going on. I did not know that man was the Pentecostal overseer of the area and the young man in the back was trying to receive the message and that man was telling him that the message was wrong and I was calling that man a blind prophet. And a guy was trying to receive a blessing wearing the wrong coat. And just that simple illustration, I had no idea that the Holy Ghost was the one doing it. That simple illustration of a man trying to wear another man's coat to receive God's blessing delivered that young man. That same God is here tonight. That young man might have went up to the meeting and didn't know God had already equipped him to be delivered. He'll deliver you because he's already equipped you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can't get it wearing someone else's coat. You've joined confederacy with Amalek and Esau. I won't hold you much longer. And the children of the East, Ishmael. Here are all rel relatives. Do you see what's happening here? All of these are relatives. Relatives of Israel. Someone close, tormenting the people of God. 
And the reason their torment was successful was because Israel was addicted to idols. Jewish historians said in that time they were so addicted to idols that they carried little images in their pockets to take out and look at them once in a while. They must have been called eye idols. Hallelujah, or an idols. <laughs> You'll get it later. Can you imagine? They, they, would, they would take them out of their pocket. <laughs> so addicted. And the, and, the, and the famine was so severe that it drove Israel out of their homes. Their homes were, were in shambles and they lived in the dens and the caves. God sent a prophet in the midst of that idolatry. And Brother Bram said that here's Gideon behind a wine press trying to thresh some wheat, afraid of the enemy because the enemy would come up with camels without number. Can you imagine the terror that was upon them with these, these, these engines of war coming through their places and they were defenseless to fight against. Sons of God could not overcome lust and could not overcome the things of the world. They was helpless in the face of this flood. And here they are hiding and Gideon's back here, he's hiding. But God has sent a prophet and this is the pattern he's used today. Because if you realize, this, this hour was so significant in the history of Israel that, that when Isaiah began to prophesy about the coming of the Lord, he said it would be like the day of Midian. Go back and read it. This will be like the day of Midian. What was the day of Midian? Total victory. But it started with conviction. A war cannot be won without conviction. God don't hand something to you that you don't care about. You can have a sword hanging on your side, but if you don't know how to use it and you don't care of it, it's of no benefit to you to quote a quote. The Bible said they came up without number. And every time they would have a harvest, they came up and would destroy their increase. You see, that's the characteristic of Satan. Every time you have a good service, he'll come in and he'll rob it from you the next day. He'll cause something to happen, maybe in relationships, something to happen. I don't know. I'm not somebody affected by thumbs up or thumbs down on, on Facebook and everything else. I'm not that person because I don't have a profile. Sorry, you don't have to be quiet. I didn't condemn you if you have one. I said, I'm not affected by thumbs up or thumbs down. It don't, it don't blow my mind that I don't have 100 friends. And I don't worry about a nameless person that I've never met that they don't like me and they disagree with me. And don't, hey, listen. Hey, man, the other day I had, I, had a, I had a man who used to be in my church. He was a minister and he, he's left the message. And he started texting me 1130 at night on Saturday night. I had to preach the next morning. He started texting me. It ended up being like 30 or 34 texts. It started accusing me that I'm, I'm, I, I know that I'm following a deceiver and you're lying to the people. And the only reason you're keeping the church is to keep the money flow going. And I don't expect you to answer. But because you don't answer, you're a coward. 11.30 at night, and I got to preach in the morning. Glory to God. I wanted to wear another man's coat. <laughs> and I sat there, and I asked the Lord. I said, do you want me to answer this man? And he said, do not cast your pearls. So I said, thank you, Lord, and I took out the enemy's text, and I did block. And I don't know if he's ever texted me since because I don't have to listen to it. I want you to know you don't have to listen to what the devil tells you. He is a lying to you. Come on, somebody. He's a liar. If he tells you this message is wrong, he's a liar. If he tells you it's a false prophet, he's a liar. God has already vindicated it. Now he's manifesting it. 
and he's asking some young person, why don't you draw your sword and destroy those two kings? They can't hurt you. They're already defeated. Glory. So I found this divine button called block. I love it. Brother Bram said Jesus didn't clown around for the devil. When he said, show me a miracle, he didn't show him anything. Amazing, the only time that Herod and Pilate became friends when they was both crucifying Jesus Christ. Some folks were never friends in life until they've all come under the conclusion Brother Branham's wrong. I'm telling you, they got the same crucifying spirit in them that was there at that day. Amen, but I, won't wanna, I don't wanna be identified with that. I wanna be identified with those that stay in this hour and draw the sword that God has given me of this message. You can't tell me it's true. God has already vindicated it in my life. He has spoke over my life with this message. You cannot tell me it doesn't work. It'll work over you. I don't know how long you have youth services. Do they go a long time, like to midnight or something? Okay, all right. I am just now starting to feel untired and good. That's very dangerous. Oh, I never set my timer. I, I got to tell you another testimony. You know, Brother Gideon, I, I once was a young preacher. Brother Samuel was too, right? I, how old are you, Brother Samuel? Praise the Lord, he's old. <laughs> I'm 54. I won't ask you how, you are, how old you are, but I know Arp is talking to you all the time. <laughs> they talk to me. I think I was around 27 or so, and I hope this is all right, because I'm only trying to tell you how God works through weakness. I can tell you, I, I'd like to tell you how big and bold and strong I am. But I want to tell you about times that I didn't even want to preach. And I sure didn't want to do the work of the Lord. Can I tell you about it? Yet God had totally equipped me. You know, but I was, I was on the mission field. And I, I was down in, in, in the middle of nowhere in Guyana, South America. And I had flown down there with a pastor. I had flown into the interior way back by the Brazil border. And we're going to minister to the Indians in, these, in this village. And this village is disconnected from, from any, any, any town or anything. It's like 70 miles to the nearest town. And we fly in there on this little puddle jumper. And the brother had told me prior to going in there, he says, we're going, I'm going, to, we're going to buy tickets to get in. We're not going to buy tickets to get out. He said, when we get there, we'll give the remaining money to some of the Indian brothers, and then go buy a ticket for while we're there. And we was going to be there eight days and have, have a revival. <laughs> a revival of eight days. And I'm American. I like return flights. I like to know that if I get in, I'm getting out. This was prior to the days of the idle bail. And <laughs> well, I'm getting drunk. We didn't have cell phones. We had nothing. I'm down there to do the work of the Lord. You can only take about 24 pounds in with you. We're going to be there a week. That means your clothes, your Bible, whatever material you're going to take. So I took two books, the Bible, a notepad, and some clothes, and beef jerky, because that's very important. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I, I, I took with me the church age book in demonology. That's what you want to take on the mission field. So I hope this is all right, Brother Paul. I got a ticket in, but I don't have one out. So I told that pastor, he's a black brother, and I told him, I said, uh, my brother, I said, uh, you know, we don't plan that way. We, we get our tickets to come out. Here I am, young. I got the ability to preach. Glory be to God. Totally equipped. I'm going to go expound to the needy. 
Did you turn me off? No. Okay, I just wondered. You know, we get in this mind that everything's glamorous. I had a guy tell me one time, Brother Michael, said, boy, it must be nice to travel around the world and preach. I said, go do it. I told that brother, I said, we don't work like that. We get a ticket in, we get a ticket out. He goes, man, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. So, of course, since he gave me that advice, I worried about it. Because that's what good people do. We worry until it consumes us. You know, it's funny. As I was flying down into Guyana from America, I, I pulled out a, a magazine out of the back, and it started talking about a woman that, that lived way back in this area we was going to go to. She was a British woman. And she ran some kind of resort or something, and, and, that, and she, it just talked about the place I read. Oh, that's nice. I closed it up and went. Well, we get, we get on the airplane, so I asked the brother. I said, is there going to be anybody pick us up? He goes, no. I said, well, do you know where this village is? He goes, it's somewhere in that direction. Don't worry about it. Now, I did not know this whole mission trip was constructed to help Danny, not the natives, even though it did. But God wanted me to learn something called patience because you're going to need it to wait upon the Lord. And I, 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 I got so consumed with worry and me and him bickered and argued. And I said, that's not how we work. We, we got people that know, we're co that, that pick us up and everything. Well, it, was, it was us brothers, us two brothers on this plane, and they had put a big painting in the airplane in the cargo section. I didn't know what it was. And, and, and so as we're flying down to the middle of nowhere to land on this airstrip where nobody is to pick us up, I asked him, um, uh, you know, what direction he didn't know. And then he starts saying, you know, there's something wrong. Well, great. <laughs> I already am not getting back home. Now there's something wrong. And he goes, something, something bad is wrong. Well, I didn't know the brother's coming down with malaria. But he goes, there's something wrong. And I go, yeah, there must be. There's something wrong with me. We land and there's a Jeep waiting there. And it's not waiting for us. It's waiting for the painting. Nobody's there to pick us up there. The painting was more important than the preachers. And the brother asked him, said, hey, can we hitch a ride with you? We're trying to get over to this, this village. He said, they said, yeah, hop in. We'll take you over to this farm. Maybe they can get you there. We ended up at this village. Nobody came to get us, but we ended up. And the whole time he's telling me, don't worry about it. And I worried about it. And we fought. You know, we're on the mission field. We're there for the glory of God, walking in his inspiration, fighting like cats and dogs. He calls me a little child, and I called him an old woman. I'm sorry. It's just the way it was. <laughs> We're there to have a meeting. See, you thought with preachers is all halos and prayer meetings. I'm trying to help you. You know, here's a young preacher. Brother Desmond told me he's went on, bless his heart, he's went on to be with the Lord now. We became real close friends. Don't think we became enemies. We became real close friends. We, we laughed about that till the day he died. I mean, you know, he's a little child and you're an old woman. It was, we had great identification with one another. And, and, uh, and he said, listen, he said, I can't preach. He said, you're going to have to preach. Now, I'm there eight days. I went into a deep depression. I got to be honest, a deep depression. Because number one, I'm not getting back home. I have no return ticket. I got to preach a revival meeting while I'm depressed. That's right. That's how it was. I can't describe to you how, how much depression came down upon me. So I went because I was depressed. I went and laid in the hammock under a tree and tried to study. So, of course, because I was depressed, I pulled out demonology. It's a good sermon to go along with how I'm feeling. <laughs> you feel oppressed? Let's look about demons, you know, <laughs> how they work. <laughs> so I did. And, you know, I opened up that book, and, it, and the first thing I saw is Brother Bram says, now on the mission field. I said, uh-huh on the mission field. He began to talk about all the dangers and the snakes and the mosquito, just touch you, you got malaria. And he says, then at the end of it, he says, but don't worry about it. Lord, will go before you and wave it all out of the way. Now, I gotta tell you, to my fault, I read that, it never moved my meter one bit. And I'm gonna tell you about the glory of God. 
The brother came to me. He's sick. He's like, give me your money. I gave him. It was $80. My last money on earth I gave to him. And he gave it to an Indian brother. And the Indian brother strapped a live pig to the back of a bicycle and bicycled 70 miles and he was going to meet us at the end of the eight days. So I did not know for eight days when I was going home when I wanted to. Last I saw of my money was when the piggy was gone to the market. <laughs> Literally. Literally. It wasn't funny then. <laughs> I'd like to tell you that I got up and preached messages that soared like the angels. But I can't remember a word that I preached. I'm telling you that to my shame, but also to his glory. Because if you're in the will of God, he's going to teach you to wait upon him. And that if you're facing something that you don't know how it's going to work out, he's saying, you just wait upon me. See, if Jether had realized who it was that was inspiring that man Gideon, it was that man that he met after the prophet came that said, Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor. Gideon's like, how am I that? I'm the weakest one in my family. I'm at the bottom of all this bad gene pool. And God says, no, you're a mighty man of valor. Amen. He actually attached his own name to Gideon because you look up mighty man, it's Gabor, and God is called a mighty man, a warrior. And he attached his own name to a coward and asked him now, before you win this battle, go home to your father's house and chop down the groves and the idols because before you can have victory, the idols have got to be gone. That's the same God that was with me in Guyana. Now, I want to tell you this story. I preached, and I don't remember a thing I preached, Brother Paul, but all I know is the chief's father came to us at the end of the meeting, and, and we was getting ready to leave to go find out if we was going home. And you asked me, did you make it home? What do you think? <laughs> this is not my ghost. Is it, the chief's father come to me. And this was on the morning we're leaving after eight days. He comes to me, and he's a Jehovah Witness. And he said, I had a dream last night. And he said, I dreamed that two angels came to the village, a black angel and a white angel. If I'd have known better, I'd ask, did the white one look depressed? <laughs> now, I want you to know how God was representing me while I wasn't representing him. And he told this man in this dream, these two angels have visited your village and he showed him two trees. He said, one tree represents what he preached and this other tree, the message he preached and the other tree represents your denomination. Take your knife and strike the false tree. God gave him a challenge to believe. And he said, I took my knife and I struck that tree of Jehovah Witness. Now, I want you to know, here I am depressed, wanting to get home, but because I was doing what God had asked to do, it was God that done the equipping. My ability had nothing to do with it. I did not want to be there, but God still showed up. Young people, that's what I'm trying to tell you. If Jether had realized that was the God that was standing by his side, it was more than his father. If he'd have just drawn that sword and finished what God asked him to finish, he would not have died in the next chapter. But I want to tell you, this is your night to rewrite what that young man could not do. Oh, yes, let me for, don't let me forget. You asked me, did it work out? Yeah, you know, we're walking through that village 80 miles away, and we're walking there, and that Indian stepped around the corner, the big old gap tooth grin, and he pulled out his back pocket two tickets. It was glorious. Hallelujah. The whole time I look back on that and God say, now listen, if you would just wait upon me and you quit worrying, I'll work it out. I'll work it out through people you think it won't work out through. I will finish the work that you think cannot be finished. I don't need your ability. I just need you. 
God proved that to me down there in Guyana because it wasn't my ability. My ability wanted me to take me back home. But God's word showed up and he finished what he started. You believe that same God is here tonight? Young people, you're not Jether. You're sons and daughters of God. And he's equipped you in this moment to draw your sword. Don't be afraid to do it. Amen, don't be afraid because your father showed you how to do it. And it's a battle that's already won. I want you to think the things you're struggling with tonight and you don't think you can overcome and the enemies told you you can't overcome it, these are enemies that have already been defeated. They've already lost their power. Every demon of lust has already been defeated. Amen. Every demon of worthlessness and hopelessness and depression and nervousness and cancer and high blood pressure, every one of these diseases have been defeated by our Lord. He's just asking you, pull the sword and show proof of his victory at Calvary. <laughs> Having said amen, that's what I want to do. Hallelujah, stand with me tonight. Hallelujah. I mean, raise their hands and say, Lord, I'm gonna draw the sword. I'm gonna draw the sword. Amen, you've asked me, amen, to finish this work that you've already done. Hallelujah. God bless you tonight. We love you with the love of the Lord. I trust that what we say, maybe just somebody put some courage in your heart. Because it's not your ability this thing's finished with. It's not how well you argue the message. Don't even do it. Don't try to reason with unbelief. Use the block button. Come on, church. This message, this message is a life. It's not who can say the quotes the best. This message is the life of Jesus Christ and the life of Jesus Christ being revealed through yours. God bless you tonight. We love you with the love of the Lord. God bless you, Brother Paul. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, why was I preaching with this?